Um, our first speakers uh, this afternoon are Donna Gillies and Dr Peter Pockney from John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle, and they'll be presenting on fast-track colonoscopy for positive faecal occult blood testing in a public hospital setting. Peter and Donna, thank you. We're going to talk about direct access colonoscopy for positive FOBT patients in a public hospital setting. I've been very lucky in being involved in this project. It's been going on for about a, nearly a year now and we started um, the direct access at the beginning of this year as a trial and then um, fully implemented it at about, on about the, in July this year. I've had a great team of people that we've been working with. It's been well supported by our area health services. I can't say that it hasn't been without challenges, but we've seen to manage to get around those as we've gone along. And today I'm going to be talking with um, Peter. He's our colorectal surgeon. This is a duet, unlike the Jerry and Carrie this morning, we aren't married, but Peter does have a relationship just like Jerry to the UK. He's worked in the NHS as well. Um, the direct, uh, just some definitions because some people from here come across from different areas and don't, uh, aren't quite aware of um, what is direct access. So direct access colonoscopy is a referral from a GP which comes directly to a coordinator, which is me at the moment, and they go straight to colonoscopy without being seen by an endoscopist prior. I screen the patient and then they get booked in for a colonoscopy. The FOBT, most people are aware of that, so it's a faecal occult blood test. The National Bowel Screening Program, at present it is performed five yearly until the age of 70. Um, that is changing to second yearly and it's been gradually implemented over the next few years. I should also note that the NH and MRC guidelines recommend that FOBT testing is done second yearly between the ages of 50 and 74. The Greater Newcastle sector is the areas that I will, ref will be referring to in this presentation and that covers three hospitals, John Hunter Hospital, the Calvary Mater and Belmont District Hospital and some of those abbreviations we use throughout, throughout the slide. We've actually worked out that we do about nearly up to 5,000 colonoscopies across those three hospitals each year. We did do a little bit of background work prior to starting this project and in 2013, in early 2013, I did a project looking at colorectal cancer patients that were, re that were referred um, to Belmont District Hospital and John Hunter Hospital. And in doing that, refer that project, one of the key things that I found is the time from GP referral to definitive treatment for colorectal cancer was quite significant. The medium time was 130 days, or the mean was 168 days. Now, for each person that was delayed, that can mean upstaging in treatment, which for each upstage is about $20,000, $30,000. And there was quite a few of those. The GP referrals were often a factor related to that. There was often poor GP referrals with in inadequate information on those referrals, which often led to delays in treatment. The other thing we did over a similar time to that, or just prior to that, was we did a project with some medical students that they looked at colonoscopies that were performed in our area, and they found that 20% of the colonoscopies that are performed do not meet the NH and MRC guidelines. And when you actually read the literature, that's similar to what's in the literature throughout the world as well. And if you're looking at 20% of colonoscopies, as I said, there's nearly 5,000. 20%, $2,000 a colonoscopy, we're talking about a huge amount of resources that are actually wasted at the moment. The other thing we found is that a lot of the colonoscopies did not meet their triage category from the time that the colonoscopy was booked to when the first patient had the colonoscopy. So there was a whole stack of delays that were there in the system that were happening that we needed to change, make some changes to improve our system. The other factors that we found is that at the moment there's, you know, we know that there's going to be an increased demand for colonoscopies with the increase of FOBT testing to second yearly. The uptake at the moment, a lot of the FOBT testing is, is performed by GP initiated rather than the National Bowel Screening Program we have found out. But with the increasing of the National Bowel Screening Program, we predict there will be more FOBT colonoscopies performed in the, in the not too distant future. One of the things that was also significant when I did the project of um, colorectal cancer patients, and the GPs aren't aware of this, is there is huge variations between when they refer to an endoscopist. You know, waiting lists vary between endoscopists 
and colonoscopy waiting lists also vary between people who perform the procedure. And in our, across those three hospitals that I referred to, there are nearly 30 endoscopists that perform colonoscopies. GPs don't know which ones have shorter or longer waiting lists, so that is something that we've taken into consideration when we've performed this project that we're doing as now. So getting on to Pete, my duet, um, he'll talk about the remainder of our outcomes. Thank you. So our task was to try and reduce the access time at the beginning of the process that may or may not lead to a diagnosis of colorectal cancer with this group of patients that we uh, know and acknowledge is a, a selected and high-risk group for, for cancer. We started by making sure we collected the right information. If you don't know what you've done and why you've done it, then you can't tell anybody else usefully what you've done and prove that you've made a difference in any direction. So there's quite a lot of information that needs to be collected. The date of the referral, the type of the test, where, where the source of it, bowel cancer screening or otherwise, etc. We then have to set about with a bit of a change process. We've heard a bit about that this morning as a concept. We decided we would need a, a central person, a coordinator, um, and that was going to be Donna. We then had to agree as endoscopists and surgeons uh, what the process would be, what patients would, uh, would score this or that or the other pathway and what the pathways would be that would be simple and manageable and uh, would hopefully improve our efficiency. And we had to decide uh, as part of that process what our screening tools or our own um, gatekeeping process would, would be for getting those uh, patients through to an invasive procedure. So you end up with a complicated diagram like this because it's a complicated process. And add that complication to uh, t two of the three hospitals mentioned, Belmont and John Hunter, are uh, straightforward, if you like, public hospitals. The Calvary Mater is a Catholic healthcare hospital that works within the public sector. So it uh, adds a layer of complexity to the uh, booking, administration, and so on process. Three hospitals, um, endoscopies being done in theatres and a dedicated endoscopy suite in one of them, and in day case theatres in the other two. We developed a form that we would use, uh, we would like to get the GPs to use to refer in. Uh, trying to capture important and necessary information that um, we would need to be able to start the screening process. Uh, this form was incorporated into the Health Pathways uh, um, uh, initiative in the uh, Medicare local. So it's available on the, if you like, the intranet for GPs and can be incorporated into most GP uh, manage, uh, clinic management systems. So it can be incorporated uh, in a user-friendly manner so that most of it is done by drop-downs and tick boxes. We had a dedicated fax number within the hospital service that would mean that the referrals would bypass the sometimes slightly cumbersome referral management system for the public hospitals uh, in the neighbourhood. And we had to get the endoscopists to uh, in agree. Um, 29 different people provide public sector endoscopies in these three hospitals, a mixture of VMOs, staff and academics. When you simplify out the, the decision points, you end up with a flow diagram that builds up like this. The FOBT referral comes in and is received. And there are then two fairly quick but necessary steps of review. The first is a review using the information that the GP has sent and uh, whatever else we can find out about that patient from the patient's existing medical record in the hospital. Some patients have bumped into the hospital service plenty of times before and we know quite a lot about them. Others have never bumped into the hospital service before and we know nothing about them. But it helps to complete what you've got before you then pick up the phone and deal with the patient on the phone. Because if, when you do the triage, the telephone triage for this, it's an absolute key load point in the whole process and one that you have to get right for all levels of, decision, uh, uh, of the process. You have to get right from the medical information process. You have to get rid of, uh, right from the um, uh, medical liability part of things. You have to get right for the administration and the booking. You have to get right from the patient information, how to take the, the prep, what the risks and the benefits of the procedure are and so on. You're doing a whole raft of things at the same time. From that process, which I would describe a little bit more in a moment, you end up with basically three streams of patients. One is a group of patients who shouldn't be going to direct access colonoscopy. They are outside of the age ranges or they have uh, recently had a scope for one reason or another. They don't need to be done. They can just be sent to the routine outpatient clinics and get sent to the routine outpatient clinics. A second group of patients is a much smaller group but an important group of patients. That is patients who you find out they do need a scope. Uh, 
but really you don't want them turning up unsorted on the day in the endoscopy unit or at the day surgery unit. They've got either complex medical history or they've got very specific medical history or related to symptoms, which mean that really you need to see them first. Now we book these in for a scope, but we make sure they're seen by an endoscopist in the outpatients first. Um, that means cramming them into outpatients and, uh, and having sort of hypothecated slots in some outpatient services, which means that you can get them in quickly so they're not delayed, but they, they, they are a bit more complicated. But the third and largest group of the people who are suitable to turn up straight for endoscopy, and that's the, if you like, our core business in this, uh, in this process. So there we are. That's the whole flow chart of how they get through to the um, endoscopy. I talked about that phone consult just now. I mentioned that there's the outpatient booking, the outpatient note that has to be made, the endoscopist has to be informed about what's coming, so there's a process of making sure that happens. The patient has to have these various things discussed with them, what the FOBT means and doesn't mean, how to take the bowel prep, what the consent process is, make sure you fill in the form that was coming to you in the post so that it comes back to us and make sure that your booking is confirmed. These are some of the things that got people excluded from uh, going straight to scope, being outside the age range or having any of these major or significant medical symptoms or things that you'd want to know about before you, uh, uh, directly before you endoscope someone. So here's the results from this first part of the, uh, from our first experience with this. As Donna mentioned, we ran this as a trial and as an evolutionary process from January through to July while we worked out the process with just three of us doing the scopes. But since the end of July, it's been an area-wide service with all 20-odd endoscopists taking part. 177 referrals in total so far. Just under a third of those get excluded for the reasons that I've alluded to, a bit over two-thirds into the system for the direct access. Um, slightly more GP-initiated ones and slightly uh, more of the uh, bowel cancer screening program ones go straight through that left-hand column. Those direct access scopes, this is where we think we're making a difference. On the left is the mean and median times that it was taking us before this system to get people from referral to scope. So our median was 82 days, our mean was 103 days, and the range was up to 18 months. We've now done or booked 101 scopes up to the beginning of this week, and we're averaging 42 days, 43 days for all of those scopes with pretty tight ranges. The ones that are blowing out to the right are really for patient-related reasons. They're not available or they're unwell. The results, um, these people often have something wrong with them. Uh, there are cancers, um, so far uh, running at about 13%. Um, there are adenomas, pre-malignant uh, or potentially pre-malignant uh, polyps. We don't count hyperplastic polyps as being in any significance at all here. These are adenomas. And like the bowel cancer screening program, that's running along at about a third. So these are necessary scopes. A quick word about the ones that we excluded for various reasons. Sometimes this was because they were double booked with another provider. Sometimes it's because they were outside of the age range. And sometimes it's because they just weren't fit for an endoscopy and the GP had sent them up anyway. None of those so far that have been scoped for one reason or another have yet been found to have a tumour or uh, significant pathology. In summary, the light blue part of the pie are the, the cancers that we found, and the darker blue one, uh, part of the pie are the polyps that we found, and overall these numbers are consistent with the screening program as a whole across the whole country, but we've improved our access time significantly. So, the direct access process in our neighbourhood has significantly reduced the delays in getting from symptoms, an uh, important subgroup of people out there who need scopes, to getting them through to having scopes. Only half or so of these people are actually normal when we've done the scope. The role of the coordinator has been very necessary in making sure that this process happens. And that's so far, and we're going to watch this over time because we need bigger numbers before we can be sure that this is real or not real, um, so far, the GP-initiated uh, FOBTs have been producing a higher yield of real pathology. Thank you.